Um, thank you, D. And thank you to the uh, Education Commission for organizing this uh, talk this evening. Um, and, and thank you to everybody for joining us today. Um, I'm gonna take just a few minutes to talk a little bit about the book, um, Faith in the Masses, uh, Essays Celebrating 100 Years of the Communist Party USA. Um, and then we're gonna jump right into our talk this evening. I'm gonna uh, also introduce our speaker, um, Elizabeth Armstrong. Um, this is such an important topic, uh, not just during Women's History Month, but all the time. Um, so first, briefly about Faith in the Masses. Um, the genesis of, of this book uh, dates back to November of 2019, um, after I completed work on Let Them Tremble, which was a collection, which is a collection of six short uh, biographical interventions of prominent Communist Party USA leaders. And so once that project was completed, I quickly began to reach out to a number of different um, historians uh, and activist scholars um, who uh, specialized in writing about the history of the CPUSA. And fortunately, um, Elizabeth was one of, those, one of those authors and she graciously uh, agreed to contribute to uh, Faith in the Masses, um, which is a collection of 12 different essays by 12 different authors. And each of the essays in its own way celebrates the history of the CPUSA and the struggle for socialism during the 100th year anniversary of the Communist Party USA. Um, topics in the book range from the party's early years with an essay by C.J. Atkins on Charles Ruthenberg and the founding of the Communist Party to the struggle for African-American equality um, and what was then called the Negro Question uh, written by Timothy Johnson. Um, other chapters include topics on the International Workers' Order and the Daily Worker and the struggle to desegregate baseball. Um, my chapter um, is a chapter that deals with the uh, 1960s and 70s youth and student upsurge and really tries to challenge the dominant myth within the uh, historical uh, profession that, that argues that the Communist Party became a marginal political force um, in the 1960s and 70s and into the 80s and 90s. Um, of course, we know that that's not the case. We know that the Communist Party continued to play a very important role uh, in the youth and student movement, in the civil rights movement, in the peace movement throughout the 1960s and 70s and, and into the 80s and 90s and beyond um, through organizations like the National Alliance Against Racist and Political Repression, through organizations like NAMESOL, uh, the National Anti-Imperialist Movement in Solidarity with African Liberation, uh, Trade Unionist for Action and Democracy, as well as a number of other uh, formations like the W.E.B. Du Bois Clubs. Um, and then the final chapter in the book uh, deals with um, Virginia Brodine, who was a early leader of the movement for environmental sustainability. And so the book, in many ways, uh, was meant as an effort to uh, encapsulate a wide swath of CPUSA related activities over the course of its entire 100 years, not just the so called heyday or old left period, which is what most historians tend to write about. Um, it was, like I said before, it was designed to challenge this myth, this dominant myth within academia uh, that the CPUSA became a marginal political force after uh, 1956, which again, we know is not the case. Um, tonight's discussion is loosely based on uh, Lisa's chapter in Faith in the Masses, uh, chapter 10. Um, and this is particularly important as the history of the labor movement, the socialist and communist movements, as well as the history of the CPUSA has often been masculinist. Um, and Lisa's chapter on Betty Millard, Gita Banagiri, I know I'm not saying that right, um, and the Women's International Democratic Federation challenges this 
masculinist history and places women's organizations and women at the center of the commun of communist activity and organizing throughout the 20th century. Um, Lisa Armstrong is a professor in the program for the study of women and gender at Smith College. She has published uh, two books, uh, Gender and Neoliberalism, the All India Democratic Women's Association and Globalization Politics, as well as the Retreat from Organization, U.S. Feminism Reconceptualized. She is currently working on a book about women's internationalism in the mid 20th century called to bury the corpse of colonialism, the 1949 Asian Women's Conference, and the praxis of anti-imperialist solidarity. Um, and I think a book recently published by Left Word Press as well. And I, I hope she'll talk some about that. And so without any further ado, I don't, I don't wanna go on any longer. So please welcome uh, Elizabeth. Go ahead, Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Um, I really appreciate that introduction and I'm really happy to be here today to talk about International Women's Day, to talk about internationalism, and um, also just to, to bring to the front the, the methods, the, the organizing strategies and tactics that have been developed over, over the century plus of socialist and communist organizing. So I'm going to start, I'm going to tell a couple of stories and they're long stories and, and one will be, I, it might be familiar. It's the story of the International Women's Day itself. Um, and then one that I don't think will be so familiar. It's the development of this internationalist, um, anti-fascist, anti-racist, anti-colonial, and very importantly, pro-socialist women's movement that emerged around the globe in the mid 20th century. So this is that moment after World War II ended, although the idea for this started during World War II, I think it's important to mention, but what happened afterwards and when they said, enough of this, enough of imperialist wars, we've had it. Um, enough of colonialism and colonial exploitation. And what they argued is that women were, were perfectly situated to take the lead on radical organizing methods. So I'm gonna tell that story. And then I wanted to think about it in our current moment. How do we imagine building solidarity across the globe to unite radical working class socialist movements um, and, and how might that happen, not just as Tony said, in March, but every month of the year. So I have here a photograph from Argentina, um, and this is uh, March 8th, what we now think of as March 8th, International Women's Day. And I thought I would tell the story of International Women's Day in order to kind of remind ourselves of where, where this day came from. I think it's taking on, I, I always add, Working Women's Day, just to remember that all women are working women and that all work is, is work. Um, so let's get started. All right. So International Women's Day is rooted in the communist and socialist tradition. It emerges out of the work of women such as Clara Zetkin, who's pictured here on the left, and Alexandra Kollontai, who's on the right. And it played a crucial role in the Russian Revolution. International Women's Day is a day to recall the struggle by women for rights and liberation and to plan for future struggles. International Women's Day is in honor of the working women who began the revolutionary process that included the first socialist revolution. So in 1896, the Socialist International met in London. Um, at this conference in London, all of the delegates met together, but socialist women delegates also met separately for the first time. They discussed the possibility in 1896 of holding a socialist women's conference. At the next Congress, this one was held in Stuttgart in Germany in 1907, so you can hear over 10 years later, um, the first international conference of socialist women was held concurrently with the main session. So it was alongside concurrent, but, but you know, separate. Alexandra Kollontai wrote that the two objectives for this conference were to, quote, elaborate the basis for more uniform activity on the part of the socialist movement in various countries in the struggle to win voting rights for women workers to establish permanent and correct relations between women's organizations 
throughout the world. So from the very beginning, it was the internationalism of this gathering that was at the heart of the struggle. The Socialist International Congress held in Copenhagen, so this picture was taken in 1910 uh, at the Copenhagen Conference. Um, this was the second Socialist International Congress held in late to, uh, 1910, also provided the opportunity for, for a, a second International Socialist Women's Conference. With Zetkin in the chair, 100 delegates from 17 countries took part in the elaborate discussions. The delegates passed resolutions on women's right to vote, on maternity insurance, protection of women, uh, uh, women and children against the war, and um, amongst these resolutions was one on the Women's Day. Clara Zetkin um, and Kuta Dunker, who was a close comrade of Rosa Luxemburg, and others moved the resolution. One part of the resolution read, quote, on occasion of annual May demonstration without any, with, with, without regard to its form, the request of full political equality of the sexes must be proclaimed and substantiated. In agreement with the class conscious political and trade organizations of the proletariat of their countries, the socialist women of all nationalities have to organize a special Women's Day, which in first line has to promote women's suffrage propaganda. This demand must be discussed in connection with the whole women's question according to the socialist conception of social things. The conference must have an international character and be prepared with care. So this resolution from 1910 did not propose a specific date for Women's Day, um, what became International Women's Day. The delegates instead adopted the resolution unanimously and figured they would, we, they would know what the date should be. Um, this was the real origin of International Women's Day. So in the years after this, it was held on slightly different dates. It was in 1911, it was celebrated on March 19th to, com to commemorate the day that the Prussian king gave way to before the masses in 1848, in the revolution of 1848. Um, the next year in 1912, it was held on May 12th in Germany and Sweden and elsewhere. Um, and it proved to be a powerful organizing tool for socialist parties. In fact, it became such a powerful organizing tool that repression around the world clamped down on the organization of these conferences. So in 1912, Rosa Luxemburg spoke at the International, Day, uh, International Women's Day rally. And at this rally, there were more than 50,000 women who were union members and workers and housewives and um, informal, informal laborers. And at this time, there was also 100,000 women who subscribed to Zetkin's um, magazine called Die Gleichheit, or Equality. So you can hear that 1912 was an upsurge year. It, the International Women's Day was forced into hiding, forced underground for several years after that. Um, because, of, because of the power that it wielded. Um, on March 8th of 19, uh, sorry, on, on February 23rd of uh, 1917, the revolutionary women celebrated International Women's Day again, and it was part of the wave of protest in Russia. The organizers decided to hold the celebration on a Thursday, which was a working day, not on a Sunday. Workers went on strike to honor the day. Viborg's te uh, textile workers came out onto the street, as did St. Petersburg, Petersburg's various workers. The women marched towards Nevsky Prospect, the city's main thoroughfare, calling to workers to join them. At the metal factories, they threw snowballs and metal bits at the factory windows, asking the men to come out and strike and raise their voices for bread and an end to the war. Younger workers started to flood the streets. 7,500 workers poured out of the factories, and when the women saw them coming, they cheered and, holding the workers by their hands, dragged them towards the main road. Women from a cigarette factory burst into the metalworks plant to pull out all of the workers. One of their leaders, with a red band on her chest, announced, Comrades, enough discussion. Come into the streets, and we will ask for bread and freedom. The workers joined them. Women who stood in long queues at food stores joined the march as well, some with their children. Students and office workers joined in. The police tried to control the march and women urged them also to join. 
128,000 people marched that day and they carried signs that said, give bread to our children. We, the wives of soldiers, demand the end of war. Long live unity. Another sign said, overthrow the monarchy. The Russian revolution began in the streets on this day on 23rd of February. In the crucible of this revolutionary, this date um, began to have its real origins. The Bolsheviks had to shut down the transportation system as part of the general strike. And Nina Agadzanova, a Bolshevik from the Caucasus region and part of the Robotsna uh, uh, revolutionary newspaper team, went to the streets with her comrades. She blocked a tram by standing right on the rails and forced it to stop. Climbing onto the cab, Agadzova seized the keys from the driver. It was acts such as these that paralyzed Russia and pushed the revolution forward. Two days later, St. Petersburg was closed down. The Tsar told the commander of the St. Petersburg military, quote, I order the disturbances to be stopped in the capital tomorrow. The military arrested hundreds of leaders, men and women. The army fired on protesters, killing 169 people, wounding over a thousand people. That day became Bloody Sunday. Outraged by this cruelty, section after section of the army began to join the people. The police also left their posts. Three fourths of the workers now had, uh, sorry, three fourths of the army, 66,000 soldiers joined the revolution with their guns. Militant workers also had arms in their hands. The workers and soldiers formed the Petrograd Soviet, and by the 16th of March, the Tsar abdicated. From International Women's Day to the Russian Revolution, that is the trajectory of the events. This was the February Revolution that began on the 23rd of February. Autocracy was defeated, but the new government led by bourgeois forces failed the people. It did call for a constituent assembly based on universal, equal and direct suffrage to write a constitution. But apart from this, it did not address the pressing questions of land and food and war. So as you can see from these early roots of International Women's Day, roots that we have largely either lost or suppressed or hidden, um, International Women's Day has long sought to find common ground among workers, among women workers and among women, male workers, with livable incomes, living wages, universal health care, fair and representative unions. They fought for specific demands for women workers, for healthy and free childcare, for women's workers' leadership in unions and workers' movements. They've also fought for protections from nation states protection from surveillance, intimidation, the lack of free speech. And they've also fought to overturn the profit motives of capitalism and commodity production under capitalism and fought for the shared profits among global workers, that workers control the global production of labor regimes. So from these roots of International Women's Day around the world, there are national traditions and international traditions that are slightly different from place to place. Some places have had long, unbroken struggles on International Women's Day, sometimes due to, to repression uh, by the state um, and anti-socialism and anti-communism that hasn't been possible in other locations. But this year, I hope that, that, that you noticed that the world was celebrating International Women's Day and not just as a way to sell women's products or to, to reach out to um, uh, sort of general women, but as a socialist holiday, as a working women's holiday. So I have here, this was from two years ago, what they call love is unpaid labor. There was a campaign around making visible the work that sustains the world we live in. During a pandemic, that very care labor that allows us to live is the care labor that finally is becoming more visible. Um, less naturalized, and the drawing together of those forces to say that there's power there, that, that all, all women workers are workers. So in this tradition of International Women's Day, um, I wanted to think also and tell you another story um, about several decades later. So we're talking maybe three, a little less than, a little more than three decades after 
1917 and the Russian Revolution and the importance of International Women's Day to that process, um, looking at what happened in mid 20th century in that turning point after World War II. So we start here in 1945, and this is a photograph um, from the World Youth Conference, which was held in London in November in 1945. And these were two of the members who, who joined this conference, who were able to get visas to leave their countries. One person, Vidya Kanuga, is on the right. Um, she was a young um, student. She was, well, not that young. She was in her tw early 20s in this photograph. Um, she was living in London, um, going to school, and had been radicalized by her um, time in London in particular, but also as a student was part of the anti-colonial movement um, in India. And here she is in London talking to Esther Cooper, um, a member of the um, National Negro Council, as well as the Communist Party. The, the woman in the middle, I I don't know who this is. I'm not sure who this is. But what we can see here is Esther Cooper and Vidya Kanuga intensely in conversation um, and, and talking about this moment at the turn of, uh, right in the middle of the 20th century, um, right as the war is ending, months after the war is ending, and saying, what next? What do we do next? So this is a story about an internationalist demand after the Second World War. It intimately connected the upsurge of anti-colonial movements in Vietnam, in Morocco, in South Africa, in India, with the movements to dismantle Jim Crow racial apartheid in the United States. And looked at the connections between that anti-colonialism, that anti-racism, and connected it to the movement against fascism around the world. So this was that moment where these struggles came together. And what we don't remember, we, I think, I think if, we, if we add our history up, we know this story, but do we know that it intersected, that it, that it came out of internationalism, that, 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 that fed the upsurge of anti-Jim Crow, anti-racist organizing in the United States. It fed the upsurge of anti-colonial organizing that was happening in colonies and former colonies around the world at this moment. Um, and it, it fed the moment after the end of the Second World War and it said no more to fascism, that this was a moment when fascism in all of its forms whether it was Jim Crow fascism and systemic racism in the United States or the, the, the colonial fascism that was ongoing after World War II. And they said, we, and here, these are two people in the youth movement. Well, what do you know, one month later in Paris, um, they moved to the um, women's conference, to the what became the Women's International Democratic Federation. It was the founding conference. What Esther Cooper was supposed to go on, um, she was denied a visa. And I'm not sure if the visa, this is a story I'm still unraveling, whether the visa was denied from the United States to go to France, or if the visa was denied by France to, um, to allow her to enter the country. Vidya Kanuga, on the other hand, not only went to the World Youth Conference in, in, in London, um, in November, but she was able to get that visa and attended the WIDF, the Women's International Democratic Federation meeting in Paris the next month. So normally we think of the battlefront of World War II as a, as a European battlefront. We remember World War II as something that happened in Europe and in Britain. But in fact, there were active battlefronts al along a much broader, region of the world. It included North Africa, Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, Libya, and Egypt. It included West Africa, and Senegal had active battlefronts. And for those of you who like films, Sembene Osman's The Camp at Tayaroui is about a massacre of Senegalese troops by the French occupiers in 1944. The battlefront also included East Asia, so countries such as Japan, which was part of the fascist alliance, Vietnam, which was occupied by the Japanese. Myanmar, um, which, is, which at that time was called Burma, was um, also occupied by the Japanese. 
um, India and Indonesia and Korea, these were all locations of war in World War II. And the battlefront was united by a coalition of fascist forces, some national like Germany and Japan, and some fragments internal to nations, such as complicity within France and complicity within the ne Netherlands during German occupation. So this conference that was held in Paris, France, um, was at the close of the Second War. It was held in December of 1945. There were 850 delegates from around the world. They were from China, from India, from Vietnam, Sri Lanka, Australia, Algeria, Morocco, Egypt, Canada, US, Cuba, Brazil, Argentina. So women were coming across Europe to attend and they were from resistance movements, pro-socialist, communist, anti-fascist resistance movements. Many of the women were, had just been released from concentration camps like Ravensbrück and from armies fighting in the USSR. So at this conference, they said, what's the moment we're in and what's the moment we want to be in? What's the movement we're fighting for? And Eugenie Cotton opened the conference and she gave a speech. So she was one of the lead organizers of WIDF and she was also part of the anti-fascist movement in France. And she argued the, the following point in 1945. We must develop a wide democratic spirit if we are to ensure peace, because the planet has become too small to support fascism in any place without the risk of unleashing a war. The International Initiative Committee of Women works to coordinate the activity of women around the world on the following essential program destroy fascism and ensure democracy in all countries. That was their program, that was their demand. At the conference, this demand, destroy fascism and ensure democracy in all countries became a site of contention. So um, Esther Cooper's comrades were also at this conference. Esther Cooper could not get a visa but her anti-racist comrades from the United States were able to come to the conference. And people like Charlotte Hawkins Brown and Vivian Carter Mason from the NCNW, the Nat uh, National Council of Negro Women. And they later co-founded the, uh, Vivian Carter Mason later co-founded the Congress of American Women, which was a pro-socialist anti-fascist organization in the United States. Also there was Thelma Dale from the National Negro Congress and the CPUSA. So in 1945, the women at this conference heard the demand for the end of fascism, heard the demand to ensure democracy. And they said, um, wait a minute, we still have colonialism. We still have systemic racism. How can we talk about the end of fascism? Because this war has ended. Other wars are still ongoing. And at the conference itself, a fight erupted, an argument erupted. And the argument said, if we are truly to support democracy, if we are truly to fight against fascism, we have to come out explicitly against colonialism. We have to come out explicitly against racism. And this coalition, and that's why I love this photograph so much, even though Esther Cooper wasn't at the conference that the intensity of their conversation between Vidya Kanuga, who talks about in her memoir, talks about how important this moment was to her political development. You can see the coalition building. Um, and in fact, it was building before 1945. These were connections that were being drawn from 1942 onwards between the anti-racist movement in the United States against Jim Crow and the movement against colonialism around the world. So who, how can you not win that fight? And they did. So by 1945, the final um, demands of the Women's International Democratic Federation were anti-fascist, against war, pro-democracy, anti-racism, and anti-colonialism. It was explicit. When Thelma Dale returned from this conference in 1945, she came back to the United States and she reported in the National Negro Congress, um, there's a, their publication was called Congress View. And she said it was an exhilarating experience. 
that would internationalize, in her words, quote, the uphill struggle of black women, Negro women in America. I am confident that exchange of experience and program with women from colonial countries, the Soviet Union, and many other lands will help us on our return to make substantial contributions to democratic developments in the United States. So this conference was a shot in the arm. It was a it was an energizer, it was a boost, it was a reminder that what's happening in one country, it may feel like an uphill battle, but you have comrades, you have sisters, you have the people in struggle that allow you to continue. So the Women's International Democratic Federation, because of their intervention in 1945, from its very inception, took an internationalist program against fascism, against racism, and against colonialism, and fought for socialism, and emancipation of women, and full equality, and rights, and support by the state. So here are their common program demands that ended the conference. Um, I think it was in the last days of December in 1945. Okay, what you can also see here at the founding conference is um, the Vietnamese delegate who was living in Paris at the time and um, fighting against the French occupation of Vietnam um, on the, within France, fighting for the liberation movement of Vietnam. And she gave a speech at this conference and she said, mothers and spouses from Europe, Czechoslovakia, Poland, Russia, France, you who suffered the atrocities committed by the bloodthirsty brutes of Nazism. And if the bloodiest drama could unfold this way in Europe, if the most cruel and barbarous actions could be committed by the most civilized countries of the globe, it is because even before this war, even during peacetime, this barbarity already existed there in a latent state. It has always existed in real and permanent ways in the colonies. So you can hear the connections and the speeches and the power of um, the women speaking at this conference. So the essay that I wrote for Tony's piece picks up from here. So I sort of told you the pre-story, um, the, the prequel to, to the essay in Tony's volume. Um, and the volume, uh, the essay in that volume concerns two people in particular. And these were people who were not at the 1945 conference. They were certainly within communist movements. One was Geeta Banerjee, who was a member of the Communist Party of India. And she's shown here second from the left. And she seems to be looking in her bag. Um, I, don't, I don't know much more than that. Um, and Betty Millard, who's pretty much in the middle of this photograph as it was taken um, in the plaid coat. Um, and Betty Millard was a member of the Communist Party USA. She was also part of CA, the Congress of American Women. And she was had also worked for a long time with Mass, the Masses and Mainstream uh, magazine. She was one of their editors. So this is a photograph taken in 1951, a solid six years after that founding conference. By this point, um, uh, the WIDF, the Women's International Democratic Federation, regularly brought in women from around the world to work in their central offices. So Geeta Banerjee was one of the central office workers, as was Betty Millard. And the essay I wrote for Tony's volume, the volume on, on the Communist Party USA, um, is about the friendship that developed between them and, and how do we think about international solidarity? What does it mean for these two women who came from very active Communist Party movements to meet someplace else again? They met actually in Paris and um, uh, they were, uh, they kind of watched the office move from Paris to Berlin because of the anti-communist government that moved into France, but they were mostly in Paris. They worked in Paris. And this is a story um, about Gita Banerjee. Um, Gita Banerjee was, was developing this conference coming out of that anti-colonial intervention and that commitment within WIDIF against colonialism. And so she was organizing the Asian Women's Conference. Uh, Betty Millard was doing a lot of the, kind of pulling together of articles around the world and they published them in a publication called Women from Around the World. And 
um, these journals were, were, or I guess at this point they weren't journals, they became quite glossy and beautiful, but at this point they were more like Xerox copies with a, with a, uh, a staple in the corner. They, but they pulled together the stories of struggles from around the world. And this process of bringing women um, together was a powerful one. And as, the, as Widdiff started with arguments, in the most powerful ways, in ways that sharpen the struggle, that sharpen um, the analysis. Um, that was part of WIDIF uh, in its history, that when you bring together women from, from pro-socialist movements, from anti-fascist movements, from democratic movements, from communist movements together, you're gonna have some healthy debate. So, the conference that um, Gita was working so hard on was the Asian Women's Conference. And this was a conference that was supposed to be held in Kolkata, Calcutta, what, it, what then was called Calcutta, um, in 1948. Um, but because of the World Youth Conference, um, remember that photograph with Vidya Kanuga and um, uh, um, not Thelma Deo, now my mind has escaped, it, the name has escaped me. But if we think of the World Youth Conference, 1948, that there was an Asian Students Conference held um, in Kolkata that many in the, um, uh, the imperialist camp, and I've seen the CIA documents, felt that that was the beginning of revolutionary movements against colonialism. And so when the Women's International Democratic Federation said they wanted to pull together women from around Asia, um, in this, and they didn't explicitly say it was an anti-colonial conference, but but everybody knew. Um, the Nehru government at that time said, "No chance, you're holding that conference here." Like we saw what happened when the youth conference was held here in February. Afraid not. Um, and and so the government said no. Then they said, "Let's try and hold it somewhere else." And they they were searching around. And at that point, Indonesia had a brief window of of. Um, possibility um, and said, let's hold the conference here. Let's hold this Asian women's conference, this anti-colonial women's conference here. And um, soon thereafter, the Dutch um, started bombing the shores, um, seeking to gain control over the country again, so it couldn't happen in Indonesia. Well, it finally ended up happening uh, about six or seven months later, um, ultimately in December of 1949 in China. So as you probably know, um, the People's Republic of China was founded. The, the end of the Civil War against Kuomintang began in the middle of um, 1949, in August of 1949. Four months later, they're welcoming women from around the world to join this conference. So this photograph that I have here is Sai Chang and Deng Yingchao and Song Jingling. These are all like, these are the, the glamorous movie stars of the Communist Party of, of China. Um, in 1949, I think they're walking in the tarmac. I'm pretty sure this shot was in Shanghai, even though the conference was in Beijing, because they, they ended up taking all of the delegates to Shanghai to see what was happening there in the workers' movements in, in Shanghai. So at this conference, an, um, another strategy was developed, a strategy of organizing women that was specifically anti-racist, anti-colonial, anti-fascist, and how to do it. So Sai Chang, I'll go back to that because it's a long quote. Sai Chang is on the left here with the sort of elegant scarf. Um, and back in 1948, she started um, making an argument about a, a, a strategy for, for anti-imperialist organizing. And I'll read it because it's long and it's dense. Um, the slogan, um, this must be the slogan under which the Union of French Women fight to strengthen the struggle against the war in Vietnam. The women of Holland must ceaseless, ceaselessly demand the cessation of the colonial war and the recall of troops from Indonesia. This slogan must also be adopted by women of other imperialist countries, above all those of the United States. They must help their sisters, not only because they are moved by a sentiment of justice, but because the struggle of women in the dependent countries against the oppressors is part of the fight for peace and democracy. Our, Asians, our American sisters must demand the retreat of the American troops from South Korea. So this is 1948. This is before the, 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 the Korean War. And the slogan that Sai Chang was asking people to remember was a paraphrase of Lenin. 
it was the slogan, a people which oppresses another cannot itself be free. And that slogan kept repeating in 1948 when they gathered for the second WIDIF conference. A people which oppresses another cannot itself be free. And what they had to figure out is how, how to put this into practice, how to make internationalism, internationalist solidarity real. So here's a picture of the conference from 1949. And you can see the camera in the front. Um, you can see the banners. This was in the, the middle of the Forbidden City and the entire hall had been opened up for the conference. And apparently it was quite cold um, this day. I keep in, in journals. Um, so Betty Millard was part of this and she took copious notes um, of, of what happened at the conference. And according to Betty Millard, the, the camera there that was carefully um, recording what happened at the conference, all of the film burned. Um, and so they ended up having to reshoot the conference in the last day and sort of recreate what happened. But this photograph is, is from the actual conference. So the, the film is a little bit um, artificial. Um, I mean, they're the real people who were there, but it, it's not exactly in, in the way that it happened. So what they developed was this two-fold strategy at this conference. And I'm, I, I gave a precursor with Sai Chang's um, um, argument that you could start to hear, a people that oppresses another can never be free. So at this conference, they developed an appeal. Now, you know, Asian Women's Conference, yes, there were over 100 delegates from around Asia, but there were also delegates from Latin America, from Cuba. There were delegates from Madagascar, from Ivory Coast. So this was an anti-colonial conference that was centered in Asia um, in part because of, of how hot the wars were um, among the Dutch, among the French, the role of the Americans, the role of the British. So this is the conference appeal that came out of that conference. And there were two parts to it. One went to the women from the countries of Asia and one went to the countries of imperialist nations. So the first appeal, women of the countries of Asia, Workers, peasants, white collar workers, intellectuals, remember that in unity lies our strength and the guarantee of victory over imperialism and feudal reaction. Sisters suffering under the burden of imperialism and the yoke of reaction, unite. And in uniting, take into consideration the concrete conditions prevailing in our respective countries and adapt them to all available forms of struggle. Women militants, take part in all of the organizations comprising the masses of women help to educate them and to defend their basic rights. So you can hear here that the demands that are being made to these anti, the women involved in anti-colonial struggles, in so, pro-socialist struggles around the world. And here you can see Deng Xing, uh, Ying Chao speaking at the 1949 conference. This is that same Asian Women's Conference and uh, raising her fist in the air. And here's the appeal, the second part of this demand, appeal to the women of imperialist countries. Do not allow yourselves to be accomplices of our murderers. Do not permit our sons to kill each other. Stop colonial wars. Insist that your governments recall the troops from Vietnam, Indonesia, Malaya, Korea. So the role of, of international solidarity was one that they developed with a two-part basis and said it matters actually where you live. It matters where you are in imperialism, in capitalism. That makes a difference. So I'm going to end and give some uh, chance for questions because I feel like I've inundated you with stories. Um, but, you know, Betty Millard came back. Um, she, uh, after the conference, um, she went to, back to Paris, back to the work that she was doing um, in, 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 in sending out materials about all of the struggles of women around the world. And um, Claudia Jones, who was the head of the, of the CPUSA National Commission on Women, she was an active writer. She was theorizing the role of black women in particular in revolutionary struggles and the fight against Jim Crow. In March, on March 8th, on International Women's Day, um, Claudia Jones delivered a speech 
um, at an event organized by the Congress for American Women. This was before they were forced to disband. Um, and the CPUSA, the Communist Party. Um, her speech was published in the Daily Worker afterwards, so it, it was both powerful when she gave it, delivered it as a speech, but also um, was spread throughout the country through publication in the newspaper, in the CPUSA newspaper. And her speech was called International Women's Day and the Struggle for Peace. She spoke in favor of women's internationalism to support peace. She spoke against colonialism, against systemic racism. She spoke against fascism. Her speech, and she spoke specifically about the US ongoing occupation and sort of interference in Korea. So this is seconds before the beginning of the Korean War. And that refusal to accept US intervention in the, in the location of Korea was deemed such a threat by the US government that she was arrested and imprisoned for a year. She was arrested many times during this period. She was first arrested in 1948, was arrested three more times um, before she was finally arrested under the Smith Act and spent, um, and then due to health considerations, or I don't know if it was considerations, health problems, she was ultimately deported from the United States by the US government. This speech, however, was powerful enough, was, was um, challenging enough in precisely the ways that the Asian Women's Conference hoped for, so that she, she, had, she, she ultimately faced um, jail time because of it, because of this speech. So as we think about our current moment, um, I've told you a little bit about the beginning of the 20th century, well, right at the end of the 19th century, into the 20th century, the middle of the 20th century, we're now well into the 21st century. Oh, this is just one more visual. Um, these were prints that were handed out at the 1949 conference, um, and they all showed various women's uh, emancipatory gains after the um, uh, Communist Party of China won the Civil War. And this is one of two women in the front. You can see them holding a piece of paper and it's a right to land. We have our land certificates. We must increase production. Better days are coming. So all of these prints, um, they were all, they're, they're beautiful. This one has a little water damage, but they all show different, different gains under communism in China. And here is something more recent. This comes from Kerala. It's by Gopika Babu and it's called um, Community. And so we know 2021, we're asking the question of the pandemic and what does it mean to care for each other? What does it mean to imagine peace and a lack of hunger and a place to live and the building of community? And this is a vision, um, in part, I was interested the way the echoing of our demands, the ways that we fought, uh, socialist women fought in the beginning of the 20th century, in the middle of the 20th century, we continue to fight today. We fight for the right to food. We fight for the love of the people around us. You can see someone giving out rations. Um, you can see people pushing a boat in order to do fishing. You can see the image of the public school. This is what community is, the care for each other, the work we put into it. So I um, have some demands um, that we talked about earlier, but rather than end on a screen full of text, um, I'd like to open it up for questions and I'll, and I'll go back to the Gopika Babu, please, because it's so beautiful. So thank you very much. Okay, we'd like to open the floor now for uh, questions and comments. If you have a question or want to make a comment, please uh, just click the picture of the hand on your control panel and we will be able to uh, open your mic. Now, if you do not want to introduce a question or, uh, or comment, then please make sure your hand is down because there's some people who have the hand up and um, okay, Irving, your mic is open. Please open your mic on your, there you are. 
Hi. I just wanted to ask, the, uh, do you feel that the, and I didn't get the full name of the, the woman, uh, Miss uh, Cooper, the, that her problem with getting the visa was uh, due to uh, a Cold War, um, the beginnings of the Cold War um, um, witch hunt and the you know, and and could you please also repeat our full name, so I don't, because I can look yeah. it up if I have to. Yes, and if you, there's a beautiful section on. Her name is Esther Cooper, and um, Eric McDuffie's book has um, has a beautiful segment on her on her travels. I have the suspicion that it was due to the opening of of Cold War um, reprisals against um, against explicitly communist um, people. So um, the, the, the three people who, the, the contingent of people who were able to go to Paris to attend the WIDF conference, they were not, they were close to the Communist Party. Um, they were not in the Communist Party for the most part. So yes, I would, I would say yes, that might be one of the earliest examples I know of in this post-war period of this kind of reprisal. So that's Esther Cooper Jackson, right? Mm -hmm. Um, yes, at this point she was Esther Cooper, but she later became Esther Cooper Jackson. Exactly right. Eric, your mic is open. Please open your mic on your end, Eric. There you okay. Are. Well, well, uh, the 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 technology is a little confusing because I did have my hand down. It wasn't, it was red and it was down. But anyway, uh, just a small point, uh, just so that people know. I, I knew I knew Betty Millard uh, quite well. Uh, and uh, uh, she she did pronounce her name Millard. Oh, okay, thank you. Betty Millard. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I could say more about Betty, but uh, I, I did know her very well. But uh, But I remember her talking about that, the long, I think it was an 11 day uh, trip by train across the Soviet Union to that, uh, to, to, to Peking in 1949. Uh, and uh, uh, she was very active with my aunt, uh, Helen Phillips in the uh, uh, Congress of American Women. Uh, she, my aunt might've been one of those women that you just mentioned in Paris who were not, who were not Congress. Oh. Okay. Uh, was, was, was she one of them? I don't know. I'll have to get your aunt's name. Yeah, Helen Phillips. Yeah. Okay. I'll find yeah. out. Uh, so anyway, there's some more I could say, but I'll, I'll, I'll leave space for other people. Okay. Looking for raised hands. Eric, your hand just went up again. So whatever you just did is not what you want to do because now your hand is up again. So please and it's still up for whatever looking for raised hands okay Mushin, your mic is open please open your mic on your end put the mouse cursor over your over the picture of the mic and click it and your mic will open on your end Mushin sadiq Mushin sadiq all right so we'll move it looks like maybe that's an okay he just put his hand down all right looking for other raised hands if you'd like to uh introduce a question or make a comment laura your mic is open open your mic at your end yeah hi uh great presentation thank you uh i'm wondering why do you think in that 1945 conference that being taking an anti-colonial stance was a difficult one to come to. What was the controversy about? Yeah, it, it's astonishing, isn't it? Um, what uh, we're in the process. There's a group of us trying to figure out what was going on at this point. The French Communist Party was not taking a hard stand against colonialism, and um, it was their weakness. Um, and it wasn't until after the 1949 Asian Women's Conference when um, Jeanette Vermeersch came back from this Asian Women's Conference and she gave a speech on the floor of, of the, the, the parliament in, in France against denouncing colonialism. 
in Algeria as well as in Vietnam. This wasn't yet uh, the Communist Party of France. They didn't yet have an absolute um, anti-colonial position. And Jeanette Vermeersch, as a, as a member of the Communist Party, was the first person to put it in the public sphere. And soon thereafter, the, the Communist Party of France changed their position. Um, so it had to do with the politics of European Communist Party. The Dutch Communist Party was equally timid on this question. They had a sort of, well, stay within the Commonwealth, you'll get more rights that way, rather than a hard anti-colonial pro-independence position. Thank you. John Streeter, your mic is open. Open your mic on your end. Put, there you are. Beautiful, beautiful conversation. Um, a couple of comments. One, one is, this has been so good, just the connecting the uh, anti-racism, anti-colonialism and all of that. Um, when they held that conference in uh, what's now Beijing, but in Peking, uh, in 1949, you comment how the the war is over in the middle of the year. Well, not out west in the southwest. True. You're right. Uh, yeah, my parents were in uh, what was called Guanshan, which is now a community within Dejingyang, northwest of Chengdu, where the big irrigation project is. Ah, okay. uh, Red Army moved, came in Christmas Day. Yeah. Now, I wasn't there. I was at school off to the east. So most of 1949, uh, I was in Mao's China, and they were in Chiang Kai-shek's China. Wow, that's incredible. But uh, but so uh, that timing thing, I know, but that, that was... Uh, that. Yeah, it wasn't a complete gain. August, August of 1949 is when the CCP... Um, declared the People's Republic of, of China. That picture in Shanghai, in fact, Shanghai was still being strafed by American planes while they were there. And they, as they were leaving Shanghai, they had to stop the train um, in the daytime because they were getting bombed by American planes. So you're absolutely right. Not only was the uh, Guomindang and the Chiang Kai-shek's forces still actively fighting um, uh, the Communist Party forces, the American planes were still strafing parts of, of China at that moment. Thank you oh. for that. That's incredible historical detail. Okay, uh, uh, Elizabeth, it's uh, uh, at the hour. So do you have any closing remarks? I don't accept that. What a pleasure to talk to people who have both personal and familial connections to this story. This has been, I've given this talk in different places, in different ways, and this has been by far the most fun. Okay, Elizabeth, we'd like to thank you for your participation and we uh, invite you to uh, lead us in a talk concerning your book release, your new book release. So everybody look forward to our announcement when we'll bring Elizabeth back to talk about her latest book. Great. Thank you very much. And thank you, Dee. So thank yeah. you, everyone. Thank you for joining us and good night. Bye, everybody. Thanks, Elizabeth. Bye.